Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Three, two, one, and we are back. And we're going to be focusing on today's show and tomorrow's show on something that a lot of you, a topic that a lot of you have been requesting. And by the way, we love your suggestions for podcasts. If you have any suggestions for us, you can text me directly at 512-758-0206. Or a lot of you will message us over on Instagram, which is at timandjulieharris.com. And uh, yeah, so either way is great. So definitely uh, just drop us a note or drop us a message over, uh, uh, what do the kids say? Slide into my inbox <laughs> Something like over that. on Instagram at, at Tim and Julie Harris, and then give us some show ideas. But this one came from, I think there's probably three or four re- uh, requests we had revolving around this particular topic. And the topic is? Yes, your guide to properly pricing property in 10 easy steps. And I think this is a quintessential topic, actually. Whether the market is shifting like we see now or not everything is going over list, sometimes it's a few more days on the market. You know, how do you decide what to advise your buyers to pay? And certainly on the listing side, how are you going to correctly price it so that you don't end up sitting on the market longer than you should have? And so that you have this strategy with your seller. So today we're talking about something that all of you need. And this is relevant too. So say for in all markets, because you might have a particular market where Things are selling like, you know, the listings are just the hottest thing. It's basically any listing you take, it's going to sell instantly. But then maybe five miles away, the market's not like that. So it may be one market, you can overprice something and maybe not have great condition location. It's going to sell. And then five miles away again, everything's going to be completely different. So knowing proper pricing skills will be relevant even if your perception is that you're selling in a ridiculously hot seller's market as some of you are blessed. And I, uh, you know, so blessed with that market. I'm thinking about all of our coaching clients in like yeah. the Bay Area in California. Sure. And um, we have a ton Different. in the San Francisco area. Talk about a market that's changed. Oh my gosh. Yeah. One of the only markets that has actually, for reals, had a price decline 10 to 12% in San Jose, San Francisco. So your pricing strategy has got to have changed even from six months ago. Not price decline by itself, but a value decline. Value decline, right. yes. But so point being, you can't just throw a dart at the wall and, and hope that, you know, because you've got multiple offers, you're going to be right. You do have to be more careful. I'm thinking about John Walkinshaw in Canada, where he's he works a variety of different types. You know, he has a lot of uh, variety in what he lists. When it's closer to town, when it's a more traditional neighborhood, it's hot. When he's 20 miles out, it's not. You have to be careful. So how do you actually price correctly? Getting great at pricing builds not only your competence, but also your confidence. So point number one, practice comparable market analysis with your broker. Do one with your broker, and if your broker isn't used to doing those, do them with your coach. Do one and then do three on your own and ask for it to be checked for accuracy. Did you arrive at the same price on those subject properties? Why or why not? Here's another question. Well, Are, but let ahead. me. So that that's a really important point. And I don't want it to slide by anybody. If you're not used to doing uh, CMAs in a market like this, and your market is changing, Julie is suggesting you uh, ask a more experienced agent, broker, coach, mentor yep. to do a CMA. You guys pick the same property, and then you do a CMA on that property. They do a CMA on that property, and then you see what their conclusion was versus yours, and that's going to help you. Uh, you know, Compare improve notes. your skills. But I'll tell you what the challenge with that's going to be. Most of your brokers, office managers, coaches, and mentors have no experience selling in a changing market. So you're going to have to, frankly, push outside of that particular, you know, maybe market. Most agents haven't been in the business for 15 years. So they've never sold in anything other than this hot, crazy market. And that includes all the leadership that's in your world. So do be very conscious of the fact that if you're going to advise or going for advice, asking people to help you who've never done or sold real estate in a market like what you're experiencing now, maybe you need to look to advice and look for guidance from other people. That's why I changed broker to coach. Yeah, well, you know, experience. No, coaches. I get it. Yep. Okay, so here related to this, are you, for example, better at pricing certain types of homes or certain price ranges? What are your weak spots? Can you accurately price luxury homes as well as you can first-time buyer homes? 
How do you handle condition or location issues? This is where some of you guys have strengths and weaknesses, so work on what you're weaker at. And we'll give you some more. So moving forward to, yes, go Well, ahead. so I'm just thinking back to what we were just talking about. And it, this really, you said something that was really important, and it's just bouncing around in my brain. Um, there are a lot of YouTube coaches, and they all, frankly, are well-meaning. I'm not, you know, bagging sure. on any of them. But none of them have been in business for very long. One of the biggest downloaded YouTube coaches has only been licensed since 2012. Well, that means that he has never experienced what a changing market was, let alone a crashing market or correcting market. So if you're selling in a market that's just like him, well, maybe you're going to be right as rain. But for the vast majority of you, you have got to learn to be more discerning by like a thousand percent who you're listening to for advice, not just about your real estate business, but in general, health advice, financial mm -hmm. advice. Start being an absolute jerk about who you're actually going to allow into your brain when they're suggesting things for you to do with your life. Most people, especially, frankly, those on YouTube, Oh, that are offering it success advice. I see this happening all the time. Yep. Somebody who's you know 30 years old telling me about how they have been so successful selling real estate. Real, okay, so Mr. 30 year old, you're successful selling real estate. Prove it to me. Show me what you've actually done. They never will respond. They will never will answer. They'll never actually give you their statistics. Why? Because they have not been that successful selling real estate. How they haven't had they haven't given themselves time to. Now, if they had sold real estate for another 10 years or started when they were younger, then they would have the track record for actually maybe having more, frankly, value with their advice that they're going to give to you. But you've got to start asking the tough questions. Our brains are wired to believe that people that are uh, essentially, uh, you know, influencers are somehow they have earned the influence and then they've been vetted by the marketplace. Guys, that's not true. Most, if not all the people you're listening to, even if they deliver information to you at, at such a level where you're just saying, how can this person be anything other than authentic? Listen to their confidence. If you're just going to be feeding off of that, you're going to be conned in most places, in most times, or at the very least, you're going to be making uh, decisions based on, I think, really bad advice. So definitely become an absolute jerk about who you're willing to listen to, and you'll quickly discover you're going to be listening to uh, far fewer people. And the four filters we suggest that you use, I'm going to go through these relatively quick, when you're deciding who you're going to listen to uh, for, frankly, coaching advice, and you can apply this to any aspect of your life, is the filter you should use first when certainly hiring a real estate coach is Mr. Real Estate Coach. Have you actually sold real estate before? A lot of the people, especially again on social, who purport themselves to be real estate coaches have never sold real estate be uh, uh, before, ever, never had a license. You are finding this surprising, aren't you, dear listener? Ask the question if you've ever had a license. If they haven't, you should immediately disqualify them. Number two, if they've had a license, ask them if they sold at least 100 homes per year in a single year. So do you have a license? You sold 100 homes per year in a single year? Okay, that might be someone worth listening to. Let's move on to the third question. Did you sell at least 100 homes per year for at least five years in a row? Now, the third level, you're going to quickly dis uh, quickly discover that very, very few people that are real estate coaches were that successful for that period of time. And uh, you know why? Because you can sell 100 homes in a year because you listed a subdivision or you listed you know a, a bunch of lots or a building. Uh, somehow you yep. uh, fell into a bunch of transactions. But to do it five years in a row at that level, chances are you know what the hell you're doing. But the last question, the fourth question, which is the most important question, is okay, Mr. Perspective Real Estate Coach. Again, you can apply this in any aspect of your life. A wealth advisor or a doctor or somebody who's going to you know, teach you how to play tennis. It doesn't matter. So the fourth question is, is have you, Mr. Real Estate Coach, actually provided at least 100,000 paid coaching calls? where you are paid to perform the act of helping that person for uh, to build their business in their personal life. And you will then instantly find out that none of the real estate coaches, well, there's actually a couple of them, especially those on YouTube, meet all those criteria. I can think off the top of my head of on YouTube of the other people, one other person, Jackie Kravitz, that's who. I know for a fact that Jackie Kravitz meets all those criteria, and she's and she's a, a YouTube real estate coach, okay? Other than that, I don't know any of them that meet all those criteria. I don't think any of them do. And, you know, they could. They just have to put in the time. They haven't been in the business long enough, you know, or frankly, they never wanted to sell real estate in the first place. They just wanted to sell info products to people in the real estate business. Be discerning. 
be very, very particular who you listen to because just being off by a couple degrees in your approach to real estate will mean the difference between you being successful long-term and not. That's right. So back to our pricing, which is related to that. If you're going to get pricing advice, it should be from somebody who's experienced, especially in a shifting market. Point number two, pay attention not just to sold comps, comparables, but pendings and actives. Sold comps are what actually happened. Pendings are reflecting current market conditions and actives are still speculating. I listened to a podcast. Yes, there's actually podcasts with appraisers on. I know it sounds really boring, but wow. I was doing my research for this and they said that uh, they're not, if, if at all possible, they are not using any comps right now that are older than 90 days old. Because if you go back six months or later, that gets to the, the big shift when rates uh, you know, went up. And then the market, and I can see, because I watched the hot sheet in Austin, and I can see when that happened, the average sale price went from 700 to 650 for a good 60 days. And then it came back up to 700 a few months ago, and now it's up to 725. So you can see why they would want to use the most recent comps that gives you today's picture in time. But pay attention to pendings because that's going to tell you what's happening now. But which price ranges have the shortest and longest days on the market? What's hot and what's not? You've got to compare that. A lot of this gets down to being proactive with your own studying of price. Point number three, take an appraisal class when you need qualifying education or continuing education. Yes, it's boring and analytical. I have been through many of them. But it will show you four or five different ways of pricing properly in addition to what you usually do. It helps to check your price when you can analyze the home in several different ways. And it, back to this podcast I was listening to, they were talking about most agents don't realize that when you use cost per square foot, that the smaller houses, all in the, even in the same neighborhood, the smaller the house is, the higher the cost per square foot's going to be. When the house gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the cost per square foot naturally goes down, and yet agents will overprice a bigger house using the average cost per square foot based on the only two comps they've got in the neighborhood, but they were smaller houses. Julie, I remember, actually, you took a CMA class at the Columbus Board of Realtors, yep. and then you took uh, an appraisal thing. And I remember when we, Julie and I would go on more expensive listings together, the first time you and I were presenting to somebody, I think he was an executive of Battelle Memorial Institute, <laughs> yeah. and you actually would, um, Julie would bring um, you know, these CMAs, uh, again, on more expensive stuff, and this was something where she was showing off her newly founded skills, and look, the seller may or may not have liked me or liked the other things we had to say or didn't maybe, you know, like anything else we had to offer. But when Julie whipped out that CMA and she dropped it on that kitchen table, that guy was in hog heaven because he was an analytical, you know, yeah. highly paid engineer type. And when he saw the work that she put into that CMA, boom, we got that listing. And you know what? That happened multiple times throughout our careers, I mean, by multiple, I mean dozens of times, where just the fact that she knew actually how to present a CMA and provide them something other than those little, frankly, uh, you know, garbagey. MLS pumped out. Exactly. Yeah. That that would get the listing. Well, that's right. And I, I think that it gave both of us confidence in our pricing ability to do this previous point about, you know, taking the boring appraisal class, but take, you know, take the information from it. Because what I used to do is two or three different methods. Obviously, you're going to use your comps your sold comps, your pending comps, and your look at your active competition. So that would give you a number, right? Then you would do cost per square foot and you would have a number. I also used to use a uh, rate of appreciation based on what they paid back when times however many years. Or in our case, inflation. Which is basically nothing because it was inflation. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so then that would give me a third number and that would create a range of the, a likely price for that home. And then you apply, because we use pre-qualification scripts, what was their uh, time frame, right? So if a, you've got that same price range, but if a seller says, you know, I probably should have listed it two months ago because I got to move tomorrow. Well, maybe you're going to price it a little bit less than if they're just kind of testing the market out because they're building new construction. It doesn't close for six months. Let's see where it goes, right? So it helps to have multiple ways of figuring it out. Okay, point number four. And I know you guys, here's, here's what their method was. The house is available. I think I'm, my price is probably right. The market's going to save me because whatever we bid over is going to be the final price. That's not really a strategy, well, although you're saying, it worked for a while. You're saying you know? in the past 15 years, yeah. you didn't know how to, you didn't need you to didn't know. You didn't have any, to know any of this. Because the house would sell itself. It could be a, basically a doghouse on a, it could be a doghouse on a busy road, smelled funny and overpriced, and it would still sell. 
Yes, exactly. Missing walls and who knows what else. Okay, so point number four, preview homes in every price range. Knowledge equals confidence, ignorance equals fear. So here's your strategy. See five homes a day, five days a week for two weeks. Start at the bottom of your market. What do you get for the money if you're a first time buyer? What do you get in the middle price ranges, which is usually about the average sale price for your town? What's the difference between semi-custom homes and custom homes? And what are the most expensive neighborhoods in your community? What makes one better or worse than another? You can systematically educate yourself because knowledge equals confidence, right? It's hard to price something. You know, maybe your next listing presentation is 500,000 more than your last one, and it's the highest you've ever, ever, ever gone on in your life. You're kind of a fish out of water if you haven't done any previewing. But look how important this point is. You might find, for example, that two-story four years in your particular marketplace are no longer desirable. All these housing trends that happen with kitchens yeah. and bathrooms and open floor plans uh, versus something that's all. So here's, you know, if you don't know what the market actually is wanting, you're going to be in a situation where you're going to be on your heels with regards to pricing. It, the more expensive, since Julie was talking about that, the more expensive the listing the more uh, you know, higher in the seller is, the more uh, experienced they are with buying and selling, those buyers are going to be more particular about all the housing trends. Mm -hmm. So it, it, lesser expensive, they're just going to want a house. They're going to want four bedrooms. They're going to want two bathrooms. They're going to want a fenced-in in backyard. Good shape. Right. But more expensive sellers, they're going to, they have traveled, they've seen, they look at housing magazines, you know, they know what is hot now and what's not hot and different. Mm -hmm. Now it's modern with an open floor plan, but six months from now, it might just be a boxed up colonial with individual sitting rooms and dining rooms and the rest of it. You have to know that's the importance of making sure you're previewing. You want to see what's selling that way when you're talking with that seller and the seller, the worst thing you can do is be in a situation with the seller where they bring up a comp. And yes. you don't know it. Or they, you know, know the seller, uh, but you don't know it. Or they it, bring out their spreadsheet. I used to hate that. Oh, they yeah. had their own spreadsheet. Oh. And you're trying to bullshit the seller, yeah. but the seller knows you're bullshitting. You're not going to get out. the listing. You're out. That's right. Okay, point number five. Again, we're going to talk about previewing. Preview new construction in different areas and price ranges. Get to know the new build reps and the builders. Refer to our podcast about how to do more transactions by knowing new construction. But you have to preview that not just to know new construction for the sake of, you know, how does it compare to other new construction, but also how does that compare to the resale that's in the same school district? Maybe you're going to price it differently because of what the builders are doing, right? So you won't know if you don't go and preview. We've done a ton of podcasts and working with new builders and new construction. Yep. We've written articles. It's all over the internet. Make sure you guys go and read all that stuff. By the way, if you have not yet joined Premier Coaching, we've made it very easy for you. Just go to premiercoaching.com, premiercoaching.com. You're listening to this video right now on YouTube. You're listening to us on iTunes, one of the other podcast listening devices. Scroll down, click the link, join Premier Coaching. Uh, it's very simple. By the way, it doesn't cost you anything to join. And yes, it does include a daily semi-private coaching call with a Harris certified coach. Do that now. That is your homework from this podcast and every other one. Go to premiercoaching.com. Okay, point number six I especially love because it is educational. It's good for your pricing brain, but it's also really secretly competitive. Preview the competition prior to all listing presentations. Your pricing will be far more accurate and you'll have a leg up when you tell your seller prospect that you just spent all of yesterday afternoon previewing their competition. When you do this every time before every listing appointment, soon your knowledge base will be vast and your pricing confidence will soar. Also, by the way, none of your competitors will bother to do that. Well, yeah, obvious because they'll sellers will that prospective seller is going to know who's actually shown or you know, they're gonna know who's active in the marketplace. Yep. But here's the other thing. Do you remember you and I used to take a a, you know, essentially a folder full of home brochures. Yes. Okay. So when you're previewing other mm -hmm. listings, you can actually grab their collateral, their marketing collateral, assuming they have any, which a lot of them won't for, frankly, they haven't realized you actually need it in this new market. Mm -hmm. Well, there you can then show the seller how the competitive listings are being marketed and you need to have a very impressive home brochure. Again, I'm leaning into the more expensive homes, especially at the more expensive sellers. It, you know, show them what theirs is going to look like, show them what their brochure is going to look like versus all the competitors' brochures. And you're going to then very nicely and tactfully help them to disqualify the other potential neighborhood listing agents from the job of selling their home. That's right. Another secret advantage. Okay. Another way to improve your pricing is number seven, go to open houses on the weekend and get to know different areas. The same home or similar may sell for a different price in different neighborhoods. Schools, neighborhood amenities, and traffic levels can all affect pricing. 
You remember we used to occasionally go like, wait, I think it was Galloway or someplace like that, where it was just oceans and oceans and oceans of the same exact kind of new construction homes. Oak Creek, phase 5700, right? So then it became which house had the nicest amenities because there's 16 model matches for sale at the same time. You're not going to know that if you don't learn these other neighborhoods and you won't be comfortable going on listing presentations when you're out of your own fishbowl. But this goes back to your previous point about knowing the new construction, because in that scenario, getting a resale in one of those areas was not something that you're going to have to work your ass off because you have to compete with the new construction builder. Yep. The house might even be more expensive than your resale home. But guess what? The builder's buying down the interest rate. So you might need to, you know, educate the seller and yourself, frankly, on how you can be competitive with regards to the interest rates and buy downs and, you know, all the rest of it. We've done podcasts on this. We've done lots of coaching and training on Premier Coaching about this. Point being is you're going to have to learn how to be more competitive. And if your biggest competitor is new construction, you need to realize that new construction, assuming all things are equal, will easily outsell resale nine times out of 10. Uh, even if the mm -hmm. landscaping is not as great, it doesn't matter because the house is new. If you're selling a house that's five years old, you've already eaten up five years of the you know life and the appliances of the roof and all the <laughs> yeah. other things, right? So this, any buyer is going to realize when I buy a new house, it's actually going to cost me less, not just because most likely the, sell, the builder has bought down the interest rates, but because there's going to be no maintenance and upkeep on this house and it comes with a warranty. Yes. And it smells nice too. Yeah. They like that. Okay. Point number eight. This is a super easy one. I have all my coaching clients doing this. Watch your hot sheets from your MLS every day. What's hot and what's not? What's getting price reductions? Where is inventory increasing or decreasing? It only takes five minutes per day to understand what's happening in your area. Listreports.com is what I use for Austin. It's a great resource because it pulls out all the stats and just gives you a one page at a glance. But you've got to know what's hot and what's not in your MLS. Also related to this, I got a great explanation again from Logan Matoshami over at Housing Wire this morning. He was talking about, we talk about these really low inventory levels, right? One of our points in the previous podcast was don't only rely on your MLS. How can we have many, you know, multiple millions uh, sales of homes in the country with record low inventory? How does that even make sense? Well, he made an interesting point. He said, when, and also uh, Altos Research says the same thing. When a home gets listed and sells immediately, it doesn't get caught in the active inventory. It goes like this. So we have a lot of activity that is not showing. It's coming and going so quickly that it doesn't get reported. Okay. So the volume of transactions is way higher than what you would think if you only looked at active inventory. Let's walk through that again. So you're a, a listing agent. You list a property. You sell it to your own buyer. It doesn't even hit the MLS. Even if it's not your own buyer. It just sells right away. Okay. So you're saying it shows up in the MLS never as being active. It shows up in the MLS or as Or very being... quickly. Like three days, it's active. It doesn't go into the 30-day reporting. It comes and goes so quickly that it's not existing active inventory anymore. That's fascinating. Which is why you watch your hot sheet, right? You see... Well, if you want to be encouraged by what's happening in the market, look at how many pendings happen every day. It was listed yesterday, pops up in my hot sheet today, it's already sold. That's the velocity of the sales, right? All of this really nerdy stuff, I know, sorry. Well, but the, again- It's interesting it's, to me. It gives you superpowers, right? It does. In the marketplace, knowledge equals confidence, ignorance equals fear. Yep. And I'm sure all of you, after hearing what Julie just said, are going to go to your MLS right now and try to find what she's talking about. Um, and yeah, don't be surprised, guys. There's only what, what did uh, would we ascertain? There's only a third of all the homes that are actually for sale are in the MLS. Is something like that? Something like that. People say between thirty and fifty percent. Think about that, guys. So and you when, know that just from new construction alone, and for sale by owners, they're like thirteen percent of the market. So when they're saying, well, there's only four million or four point five million homes projected to sell this year. First of all, there's two transactions for each of those deals, each of those homes that sold. But what if that is off by half? What if it's actually eight million or nine million? And you include all this other stuff that never hits the MLS. Yeah. So. Go sell a house. Okay. All right. Point number nine. And we did this. If you remember Mary Fee, our friend down the street. We did. Uh, befriend an appraiser so you can call them and check your comps, especially on unusual properties or when you lack confidence. Not all homes have obvious comparables. This is anything that's unusual, that's not cookie cutter. Maybe there aren't any comps for, you know, the only comps are four or five years old. You have all these different circumstances. 
You need to be friends with an appraiser where you can just run it up the flagpole. That doesn't mean you're going to pay them $500 to be doing a full-blown appraisal. But remember, they price property day, all day long, every day. Now, here's, the, again, advanced coaching uh, warning. We would go on appointments, and we've coached our coaching clients over the years to have this in their back pocket as well. And you'll have a motivated seller. But they are. let's say this house is way too nice for the marketplace. Sure. And you're going to come across some of these where you're going to walk in, you're going to go, what the hell happened in here? I mean, HGTV exploded everywhere. I know. You know, yeah. I mean, that's definitely not a majority of the listings you're going to go on, but it's going to be here and there. But the seller is going to be way over invested in the property. Yeah. They may have done additions and fancy stuff. It was just a personal passion project. They've got a for them. waterfall in the backyard. They've got a fish pond. They have all these things. Exactly. So you're going to have situations like that where there is really no way that you're going to get anywhere near what they have invested in the house back out of the house. And you love it. You even want to buy it yourself. It's miraculous. This thing is the best thing since sliced bread. Well, it's impossible to put a price on something like that. So a lot of times what we'll do, what we did, what we coach our clients to do, um, obviously, and let's say the seller's motivated. They have to sell the house. They're relocated, whatever's going on. Opposed to trying to figure out and frankly cross swords with them if there is a uh, disagreement about possible price, is call on an appraiser or have this as something you can say. So Mr. Seller, here's the challenge we have. This property is absolutely stunningly amazing. This is definitely one of the top five properties I've ever seen in my life. Probably one of the you know top three in this marketplace. But let's do this. What we need to do is we need to have an appraised, the home appraised. And here's the reason why. Uh, we need to leave and listen to what I'm saying here, guys. We need to make it so when those buyers come in and those buyers agents come in, or maybe I'm bringing my own buyers in, and they're thinking the same thing, best house ever, how are they coming up with this price? We need to have an appraisal sitting there on the kitchen counter so that they can see it so then they feel more confident with how we derive the price. You guys get what I'm doing there? So what's really going to happen is the seller. And we, we I remember when Julie and I sold real estate, this is what we would do. This is kind of our plan Z with situations like this, is the seller, ex with one exception, agreed to do the appraisal. And so if they say, well, I think that's a great idea, you probably just got the listing because you came up with a creative way to, you know, frankly, placate the seller and possibly, by the way, um, you know, fill in your own skills gap with doing an appraisal or coming up with a valuable market price. So the house is now going to have it, you know, you know, position it, right? So Mr. Seller, you're going to have this appraisal done and here's what I'll do. Let's do it this way and I'll reimburse you at closing for the cost of the appraisal. See what I'm doing there? You will take the listing. You're going to have it appraised at whatever market price is, and you think this is such a good idea, you're more than willing to cover the cost of the appraisal uh, at closing, four or 500 bucks, whatever it's going to cost. No problem. In other words, the house has to sell, and you'll just reduce your commission by the four or $500 mark. Okay, what's going to happen is the seller won't want to have that done, and then they're going to be way more um, willing to listen to what you think the value of the property is based on actual comps, and then fluffing up the values uh, to reflect the actual, frankly, superior condition of the property. You guys get it? See what I'm doing there? You have to learn how to do these things in a marketplace like this. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to take the number of listings you otherwise would have. And frankly, you won't be able to work with as many people as you otherwise could have. Versus what the egotistical agent will say, I walked away from that listing because the seller wanted too much. Yep. Versus having a professional approach to dealing with that. You really do need to be doing not one, not two, but all of these points. Our final point, number 10, of course, you knew it was coming. If you need help with this, and this is a hot topic, on all of our coaching sessions every single day, there are pricing questions. How do I deal with these comps? What do I do in this situation? Just go over to Premier Coaching, premiercoaching.com. Sign up today for free so that our professionally Harris certified coaches can help you with your of the second pricing questions and everything else that you guys are dealing with. Right. Scroll down now. And if you're uh, obviously all of you are listening on iTunes or Spotify or Amazon or Google, every place you can possibly listen to us which are hundreds of places. This is the number one list to daily podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. In the show description, there is a direct link to join Premier Coaching or just Julie just said, you can just go to premiercoaching.com. In the meantime, guys, thank you for keeping this number one listen to daily podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. This podcast has actually increased the number of people that are downloading and listening uh, by double digits this year. We will have tens of millions of you that have listened to us in just the past few years. It is our pleasure and our honor to be your real real estate coaches because, by the way, those four questions I gave you earlier, Julie and I checked the boxes of every one of those. <laughs> I should have Indeed. made that clear. Yes. In the meantime, you guys have a fantastic day. We'll talk with you on the show tomorrow.
This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.